Tall Hover Combat Manual. In the history of medieval martial arts, few documents are as mysterious as Hans Tallhofer's fighting manual. A 15th century fencing master, Tallhofer authored a series of combat manuscripts, the most enigmatic being his 1467 creation that intertwines martial skill with bewildering illustrations. This manual, more than a mere instructional guide, is a riddle wrapped in the guise of a combat textbook, challenging modern historians and martial artists with a perplexing blend of fighting techniques and cryptic illustrations of unusual combat scenarios. Born in the early 1400s, Hans Tallhofer remains a mysterious figure himself. Little is known of his life, but his manuscripts, particularly those from 1443 to 1467, are a trove of historical combat methods, capturing a world where martial skill was a key to survival and honor. Some evidence points to him being a member of the Marksbruder Fencing Guild. Recognized by Holy Roman Emperor Frederick III, this group could bestow the title of Master of the Longsword to proficient members, which would then entitle them to twice the pay of an ordinary soldier. Tallhofer's famed 1467 manual encompasses a wide range of fighting techniques, including unarmed combat, dagger fighting, longsword techniques, and even combat in armor. The illustrations are vivid, but notably cryptic. Unlike modern manuals, Tallhofer's work lacks explanatory text, leaving the interpretation of sequences open-ended. One of the most debated illustrations is of the so-called judicial duel. It depicts a man and a woman engaged in combat in a specially prepared arena, an image that has sparked discussions about gender roles in medieval combat and the nature of trial by combat. However, the manual's greatest mystery may lie in its purpose and audience. Was it intended as a practical guide for students of martial arts, a showcase of Tallhofer's skills for potential patrons, or a work of art? The Enki Tablet Hidden for millennia beneath the ancient sands of Mesopotamia, the Enki Tablet is an ancient cuneiform tablet dating back over 4,000 years. It tantalizes with a narrative both familiar and bizarre, detailing instructions for building an ark that echoes the biblical Noah's story, but with an astonishing twist. Unlike the well-known Ark of the Bible, the vessel described in this ancient text is far from ordinary. The Enki Tablet, named after the Sumerian god of water, knowledge, and creation, was unearthed in modern-day Iraq, a region once known as Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. Mesopotamia, with its rich and fertile lands between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, was home to some of the earliest urban societies, including the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. Written in the dead Akkadian language, the Enki Tablet is part of a larger narrative that includes the famous Epic of Gilgamesh, an ancient Mesopotamian poem that's among the earliest known works of literary fiction. The tablet is inscribed with a series of instructions given by Enki. Deciphered by Dr. Irving Finkel, a British Assyriologist and curator at the British Museum, the most captivating aspect of the Enki Tablet is its detailed description of an ark. According to the text, Enki instructs Atrahasis, a Sumerian king, to build a giant boat, providing specific dimensions and materials. This narrative resembles the biblical story of Noah's Ark, leading some scholars to speculate about a common source or inspiration for these flood myths. The instructions on the Enki tablet describe an ark of considerable size, with precise measurements and a comprehensive list of materials. The ark, as per the tablet, was to be a massive, multi-story vessel, capable of withstanding the great deluge that was to cleanse the earth. The ark described in the tablet is notably different from the traditional depictions in the biblical narrative. It's not the familiar rectangular vessel, but a massive, round coracle. These circular boats, typically made of reeds and bitumen or asphalt, were common in ancient Mesopotamia. However, the similarities between the Enki tablet's narrative and the biblical story of Noah remain profoundly striking. Both encompass a global flood, a lone group of survivors, a divinely designed watercraft, and the imperative to preserve all animal species, with the eeriest parallel being the specific description of animals arranged two by two in both accounts. This remarkable congruence raises intriguing questions. Why are these ancient stories so eerily similar, especially given the vast chronological and geographical gap between the Sumerian and Biblical texts? The enduring mystery of these parallels 
reminds us that the concept of a sole survivor of a great deluge may be an idea far older and more universally rooted in human history than we ever imagined. Malleus Maleficarum In a time when superstition reigned supreme, and the fear of the unknown lurked in every shadow, there emerged a book so sinister and impactful that its echoes are still felt today. The Malleus Maleficarum, a name that translates ominously to the Hammer of Witches, was not just a book, but a weapon of fear and oppression. Authored in the late 15th century by Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Springer, this manual for witch hunting sowed terror across Europe, guiding a frenzy of trials and persecutions. Its pages, steeped in fear, misogyny, and chilling instructions, played a pivotal role in the witch trials that swept the continent. But what dark secrets and controversial instructions lie within its pages? How did a single book help ignite a firestorm of witch hunts that would consume lives and alter history? Heinrich Kramer, serving as an inquisitor for the Catholic Church, a role designated to individuals tasked with identifying, investigating, and prosecuting those accused of heresy, compiled the Malleus Maleficarum, along with his colleague Jacob Springer. Inquisitors like Kramer were often feared figures, endowed with substantial power and authority to root out religious nonconformity. The work was written after Kramer's authority was questioned following a failed witch trial in Innsbruck, Austria. Its publication was a response to this challenge and an attempt to establish a methodical approach to witch hunting. The book is divided into three distinct sections. The first section argues vehemently for the existence of witches in witchcraft, countering skeptics who doubted the reality of such phenomena. It presented a world where the devil was an active force, constantly seeking to corrupt and lure humans, particularly women, whom the authors viewed as more susceptible to demonic persuasion. The second section of the Malleus Maleficarum is perhaps the most harrowing, detailing the methods of identifying and interrogating witches. It outlines signs of witchcraft, ranging from the telling of fortunes to the presence of certain physical marks on the body. The book infamously endorsed the use of torture, arguing that it was a necessary evil to extract confessions and the names of other witches. This section also described various types of witchcraft and spells, feeding into the paranoia and fear of the unknown. The final section provided legal guidance on the prosecution and punishment of witches. It served as a manual for conducting witch trials, emphasizing the importance of public confessions and demonstrating a disturbing disregard for legal norms and the rights of the accused. This part of the book was instrumental in legitimizing and systematizing the witch hunts, giving them a veneer of legal and moral authority. The influence of the Malleus Maleficarum was profound and far-reaching. It was second only to the Bible in terms of its widespread distribution and impact during its time. The book was used as a reference in witch trials across Europe, with witch hunts reaching their peak between the late 16th and early 17th centuries. By the end of the 18th century, it is estimated to have contributed to 40,000 to 60,000 deaths from witch hunts, most of whom were women. The Ebers Papyrus This papyrus, discovered in the mid-19th century, has bewildered and fascinated scholars, historians, and medical professionals. Its contents, a curious blend of medical knowledge and magical incantations, offer a unique glimpse into the sophisticated world of Egyptian medicine, where the mystical and the empirical coexisted seamlessly. The Ebers Papyrus, named after the German Egyptologist Georg Ebers, who purchased it in 1873, dates back to around 1550 BC, making it one of the earliest comprehensive medical documents in existence. It's believed to have been composed during the 18th century in the New Kingdom period, a time of great prosperity and cultural advancement in ancient Egypt. The papyrus itself is a collection of medical texts, stretching over 20 meters in length, and contains approximately 700 magical formulas and remedies. It covers a range of topics, from dental issues, skin problems, and digestive disorders, to more complex conditions, like depression and heart disease. The papyrus' journey to the modern world is as mysterious as its contents. It was reportedly found between the legs of a mummy in the Theban necropolis. The mystery deepens with its acquisition by Georg Ebers, as the details of its discovery are sparse and steeped in the secrecy typical of 19th century antiquities trading. Its translation, a monumental task, 
has unveiled a world where spirituality and medicine intertwine, offering a rare glimpse into the medical practices of a civilization that flourished over three millennia ago. Among the wealth of information, several remedies stand out for their mysterious and peculiar nature. Crocodile dung is birth control. Some of the most startling prescriptions are contraceptives made of crocodile dung, honey, and sodium carbonate. Modern science suggests the dung and sodium carbonate may have been somewhat effective due to their alkaline properties. Crocodile Effigy for Migraines This unique remedy involved a clay crocodile with herbs in its mouth, bound to the patient's head with a linen strip inscribed with God's names. It aimed to dispel pain-causing spirits. The cold compression from the clay effigy may have unintentionally relieved migraine pain. Magical Spells for Epilepsy Intertwined with practical remedies, the Evers Papyrus contains magic formulas and incantations believed to heal ailments and ward off demons when accompanied by specific actions. While much of the Evers Papyrus can be understood through the lens of modern medical knowledge, certain aspects remain unexplained. The mixture of practical medical advice with spells and incantations raises questions about the Egyptians' understanding of the cause and cure of diseases. Still, as researchers delve deeply into the papyrus, they continue to find intriguing parallels between ancient and modern medical practices. The Antikythera Inscriptions Discovered in 1901, the Antikythera mechanism, often hailed as the world's first analog computer, is an assemblage of bronze gears and plates. Its complexity has long baffled historians and scientists, but recent advances in technology have allowed them to begin to restore and decode lost inscriptions found on the device, gaining new insights into its function and usage. The Antikythera mechanism, dated around 60 to 70 BC, first came to light when sponge divers retrieved it from the sea. Initially, it didn't attract much attention, appearing as a lump of corroded bronze and wood. It was only later, when gears were noticed within the lump, that its significance was recognized. The mechanism consists of over 30 gears and is housed in a wooden frame, with inscriptions on almost every exposed surface. Written in ancient Greek, the inscriptions on the Antikythera mechanism are essentially a detailed user manual. The inscriptions are found on the front and back plates and on the small dials and components inside. The task of deciphering these inscriptions has been Herculean. Over the years, the text has become barely legible due to corrosion. However, modern technologies like X-ray computed tomography and 3D scanning have enabled researchers to read more of the text, revealing astonishing details about the mechanism's capabilities and the astronomical knowledge of its creators. The inscriptions include references to the Metonic Cycle, a 19-year period used to align lunar and solar calendars. They also mention the Saros Cycle, an 18-year period related to predicting eclipses, and the Calypic Cycle, a 76-year cycle for calibrating calendars. Additionally, the inscriptions provide detailed guidance on tracking the Moon's complex motion, reflecting the ancient Greeks' understanding of its varying speed across the sky, a feature possibly modeled by the mechanism's advanced gear system. Beyond lunar motions, the inscriptions likely include instructions on predicting eclipses, a significant feat of ancient astronomy with both scientific and ritual importance. While some researchers speculate about the mechanism's capability to track planetary positions, this aspect remains under investigation. The study of the Antikythera mechanism's inscriptions is ongoing, with new discoveries continually refining our understanding of its functions and the extent of ancient Greek astronomical knowledge. Each deciphered line adds a new dimension to our perception of ancient science, hinting at a level of sophistication previously thought unattainable in that era. Are you ready to unlock the secrets of the past? Subscribe now to Dark Five's brand new Ancient Mysteries channel and embark on a journey to uncover the most enigmatic and awe-inspiring mysteries of ancient times. Leave a comment if there are any ancient mysteries you want us to explore in upcoming videos.